Cool. All right, I'm going to try to be fast because I think we're running a little behind. But I um, have a fun story for you today. It's about dogs, football, the Eagles, Super Bowl. Um, so please note, this is two Super Bowls ago. This, this is a little bit old. Um, but yeah, let's jump right into it. Um, how many people know what the farmer's dog is before I give a quick intro to it? Oh, wow. It's, that was not the case a few years ago. That's crazy. Um, OK, so just to quickly cover, we make fresh, human-grade, nutritionally balanced food for dogs, we deliver it directly to their humans as a subscription. Um, our recipes are formulated by veterinary nutritionists and produced in the same facilities regulated for human food. The latter part isn't the case for most dog food, which is like technically called animal feed grade and not produced up to standards for human consumption. Um, we think dogs should basically eat things that would be safe for us. Um, also, let me give you some quick background on um, the humans at the company. We're a relatively small engineering team um, relative to the overall company and business itself. Um, and we take pride in that. We want to create the most value we can with the fewest people. Staying as small as possible helps us move quickly with less time spent on communication and coordination. Uh, but this talk is about the Super Bowl specifically, not the farmer's dog. And that story begins in early January 2023. Uh, we just wrapped up a whole week where everyone was on site for what we call quarterly planning. Um, when I learned the news that we had purchased an ad spot for the Super Bowl. This was top secret at the time, and the work involved just simply became known as Project Daisy, like the flower. Um, I would explain why this is, but I actually still don't know the origins of this myself. Uh, Project Daisy became like a whole, a whole thing until um, like a week before the Super Bowl. Okay, so I'll foreshadow a little. Um, these are the top replies on the YouTube page for the ad. Like at this time, throughout the whole thing until like right before, I think maybe the day before we saw it, we had no idea what the creative would be. Uh, but it really turned out to be a runaway hit. The response was overwhelming. If um, I'm not sure if the comments are visible, if you could read them, they're too small, but everything's overly positive. People were crying, uh, same response, social media in person. Okay, but while our colleagues were hard at work on this tearjerker of an ad, this is what we had to deal with over in engineering the next few weeks. Um, just note the, the highlights are just what's critical to sign up, which is the main thing we were concerned about um, for this app. People are going to see the ad. They were going to explore the sign-up flow, maybe try to sign up, and we wanted to make sure this didn't go down. Um, please also note this is only the relevant portion of the system, and I'm glossing over a lot here. Uh, I also cannot possibly capture all the tech debt and pain underlying these boxes, but for now, imagine it's there. I'm going to cover some of the specific things we fix later on. Uh, the one big exception to this, though, is TOSA, the totally optimized sign-up application. Except it wasn't totally optimized yet because it wasn't even close to finished. Uh, this was our attempt to decouple that anonymous portion of the user experience, what happens before sign-up, before you're a customer, from that customer portion post-sign-up. Okay, so like going in, we knew there were some steps we could or couldn't take that were just obvious to us, so let's get those out of the way. Well, it would be great if we could make the system more loosely coupled to scale up more easily where we needed to. We like simply just did not have enough time to do that. We couldn't finish TOSA. We couldn't extract new parts of the API out. Uh, we didn't even have enough time to fix most issues that would allow us to improve like the existing uh, generally monolithic architecture. So you notice there was no cache layer. There was no read replicas. Just the way everything was set up, the tools we were using, we, we couldn't do that in this amount of time. All right, so now's where I get my disclaimer. I'm going to talk a lot about things we do um, and why it works for us. The point of telling the story isn't to convince you that that's the best and everyone should copy us or that the way we work uh, or like the work we did for this was like in of, in of itself some miraculous feat. I'm sure many people here today deal with this level of traffic all the time. Maybe like that's your baseline or frequently you get spikes like this. Uh, my hope is to use the story to illustrate like how we were blindsided with this surprise, scrambled everything we could muster to deal with it in a short time, a few weeks, and actually succeeded. So it was almost like a big incident but nobody was upset, like the business had a great outcome. Um, so the system behavior I'm describing is a concept we call resilience. And the practice of understanding how systems are able to perform in this manner and then amplify that performance in the future, among other things, is known as resilience engineering. And whether you realize it right now or not, I'm certain this is something that your system is already doing, your socio-technical system, the humans, and adapting the software components. Hopefully some of these ideas will resonate so you can take them and apply them in your own org moving forward. All right, so first and foremost, off confused, I need to take a minute to differentiate robustness from resilience. The drawing pictured here is by Lauren Hochstein and part of his intro post available on his GitHub repo. That's the link. Um, so 
uh, Lauren notes, a resilient organization is one that adapts effectively to surprise. Pretty simple. That's a summary of Dr. David Woods' definition, who is um, like one of the founders of this field, worked with NASA. Um, resilience engineering is a, a multi-discipline field uh, that helps a lot of different industries um, be more safe. So nuclear power, aviation, study all of these things, safety in these fields, how to be resilient. We'll be hearing a lot um, from Dr. Woods today. So robustness, the solid line, is about how the system handles known failure modes. So you think about it, it's like all the things we do ahead of time to cover our bases and prevent specific types of failures. Um, resilience, on the other hand, this dotted line, uh, is about how well the system can handle troubles that were not foreseeable. So it's kind of like about how we respond after the fact and be prepared to respond. We're not exactly sure what the response might be. So just quick and dirty example, and, and it's more than that too, but this is just to help frame it. Um, robustness could be you have an auto scaling group. So if you have a traffic spike, your servers can scale and handle it. Um, resilience might be if you did not foresee, oops, someone could delete that auto scaling group and you had to get your system back online so it's still working. Um, so a longer definition from Woods. From the perspective of overcoming the risk of brittleness, a third use of the label resilience becomes the idea of graceful extensibility, which is how a system extends performance or brings extra adaptive capacity to bear when surprise events challenge its boundaries. Boundaries, okay, so what does that mean? Um, it's hard to talk about resilience engineering without introducing the model that was proposed by Jens Rasmussen. It's often just called the Rasmussen model. So it depicts these three boundaries which have crossed lead to the different failure modes labeled there. I hope everyone can see that. Um, so the idea is complex systems are improving and changing all the time. We're always trying to improve performance, but that uh, causes us to drift closer to one of these boundaries depending on what we're changing. Um, and then we have to sense it, make different improvements to push ourselves back away to not have an accident or have an economic failure or have people burn out. So the model neatly depicts that we have to make these trade-offs with our limited resources to head off the different types of risks. There's no like thing you can do to just not have any of them. You do one thing, you're probably increasing risk somewhere else. It also neatly depicts the error margin, which serves as the danger zone for accidents, which is that boundary of functionally acceptable performance. All right, let's keep talking about boundaries. So again, there was that workload boundary, which is kind of like, Burnout, this is my personal GitHub contributions. Extreme example, not everyone worked like this, but it illustrates like the massive amount of work that went into this effort. Um, you, if you try to sustain this workload, you will burn out. This is not sustainable if you do it over a long enough period. But you can also see like it was clearly not sustained and I think it was really important that um, as far as like hands-on computer time, there's a ton of rest going in. I mean, that's also pretty, um, natural for, for what my role was at this time. I wasn't very hands-on, but that was part of the adaptive capacity. I could get in there and start doing a ton of code work over a short period of time, which is not typically what I was doing at the time. Okay, so let's try to apply this model. This is like a crazy oversimplification with just three points on here, but this is kind of how I imagine we drifted around during those four weeks. Um, we definitely pushed ourselves up to the error margin, I know, because we were having accidents like early on uh, when we were trying to make this better and we were throwing everything we could at the problem. Like everybody was working on this. We had everybody like as system operators trying to do hands-on knobs and levers to, to deal with the traffic. Um, eventually we did get over the hump and had capacity to spare. But at that point you saw my, my GitHub chart, uh, not everybody was like that, but we were close to that burnout um, boundary. I feel like even though we were safer and we didn't have any economic loss. Um, so this quote comes um, from Dr. Richard Cook's somewhat, I think, famous, How Complex Systems Fail. Has, has anybody read that before? Okay, not a lot of people. Actually, you should definitely go and read this. It's, it's great. I think it'll resonate. Um, this is point number 18 in the paper, which is failure-free operations require experience with failure. Um, and the quote goes on, recognizing hazard and successfully manipulating system operations to remain inside the tolerable performance boundaries requires intimate contact with failure. More robust system performance is likely to arise in systems where operators can discern the edge of the envelope. And um, it goes on beyond that. This is where system performance begins to deteriorate, become difficult to predict, or cannot be readily recovered. 
Um, so the edge of the envelope to me kind of aligns with that error margin in the Rasmussen model we were looking at. So we have to know where that is in order to create more robustness in the future. So we had no idea where that was. Um, we knew we had our work cut out for us, uh, but we had like a lot of us had experience with this level of traffic, but never in this system. Um, with these people, with this software. So th this is like, let me go back. We were approached by the business and asked if we'd be ready in time to like do some earlier round playoff games too, different ads, but we were running ads. Our answer was like, no, probably not, but please buy the spots anyway because we need the practice and real world data from running these ads in production. And we promise to do our best. Um, I think this has turned out to be like one of the most important steps we took. We learned things in prod we just couldn't simulate with load tests and staging, which we did like all the time, almost every, like many times a day. Um, but what you can see here is like, we're improving the whole time. There's the step function change between the second and the third game, which we were able to do in like one day. We, we learned so much from that John 21 game, fed it back into the system, much better performance. But even on uh, the Cowboys Niners game, you could see we, we got a lot more traffic that was able to get through, but the error rate went up. And we, so we still had customers having a bad experience. By that last game though, we have that nice slope, uh, big peak, and then it comes back down, good curve, very little errors, a little less traffic, than the week before, but um, you know the system performed really well. So once again, adaptive capacities exist before changes and disruptions call upon those capacities. Systems possess varieties of adaptive capacity and resilience engineering seeks to understand how these are built, sustained, degraded, and lost. So the engineering part is understanding how these are built, sustained, degraded, and lost. So to start talking about that for us, I have to have some more background. Leslie set me up perfectly. Um, we have one integrated department referred to as prodding, which is short for product and engineering. Prodding is further divided into pods, which are kind of like our squads, if uh, you use that term. Our, our, all pods build product. The only differentiating factor for any of them is who the customer is. And that extends to the platform pod. The only difference between the platform pod and these product pods is that the platform pod builds product for engineers. Uh, platform helps select the best vendors. We think solve the problems the pods are, are facing. We work with them. And then we fill in the gaps to make it a coherent product offering. So we believe in true ownership at the farmer's dog. There is no division of dev and ops. We think we want everybody to have this like wide bro uh, breadth of uh, thinking about product in the early stages and understanding how the product we're building is working in production. There's still different um, areas of expertise. People go deep in different areas, but we just don't organize around that. All pods develop and operate the service to stay on. And we're not there yet, but we believe uh, every service should have one clear pod owner and those little dotted lines kind of signify there's still some shared things. Um, so organizing this way, I think, has helped us employ a number of beneficial practices that provide the capacity for us to adapt. Uh, to us, continuous deployment is just an extension of ownership. When every commit to trunk triggers a deploy, there is no ambiguity over who is responsible for the impact of that change. I, I think a lot of places have like SRE teams because you know you're, you're batching deploys. It's not clear you can't say which um, team um, batching commits and deploys. You can't say which team or which person. Um, would be called if something were to go wrong. Uh, you have to have a separate function actually own that layer. For us, that's, we don't need to do that because it, it's very clear. And as you'll see in a moment, it also allows a scale rate of change as needed without adding risk. Uh, I'd also note some of these practices are in regard to like branches and versions. Long live branches and versions create distance in the system, it makes it hard to understand. You're not really sure exactly what's running and, and you're interacting with. You have to do some searching around either you know, find uh, what's on staging right now in that staging branch or go back to an old version if you have multiple versions running in, in prod and people using different versions of APIs and stuff like that. Uh, monorepos also have a pretty big benefit to making system-wide changes in and of themselves. Like for example, if we have a package with a zero day vulnerability used in all of our backend services, we can fix it across the whole code base with one PR. Um, so in summary, these practices allow us to change our running software rapidly, safely, while aligning all engineers with how our software works in production and providing hands-on experience for working in production. Um, and so this provides the humans the capacity to adapt the software part of the system and the capacity to reorganize themselves around a wide range of potential problems. Um, and one thing I just note about like devs in production, I know that's not 
not everyone does that. If you prevent outages by keeping devs out of prod, to me, it's like keeping your kids from getting hurt by not letting them ride a bike. Uh, when riding a bike, you need to fall down to learn to balance or at least lose your balance. Instead, we use training wheels or put pads on our elbows and knees to prevent getting hurt. All right, so this is what one of our typical deploy pipelines looks like. In the monorepo, you'll notice it's pretty simple. Um, there's a few steps that we allow all the teams to define themselves. They're just hooks, but we expect everyone kind of runs these steps. Uh, a commit is usually on prod five to 10 minutes after merging to main. So very short amount of time. Engineer, you know, doesn't have a lot of time to go start working on something else. Essentially, they're watching this pipeline, can check out all, all the metrics and observability data to make sure that it's doing okay after, after merging. And this is what our um, deployment metrics look like. By keeping our feedback loop to prod fast and practicing continuous deployment as a standard, we can just scale up that rate of change as needed without safety concerns. Uh, some days you'll see, you'll, you'll notice we push out like 20 changes, maybe less. More recently, we had a spike to 75 deploys in a day. But whether we deploy 20 times or 75 times, the risk is low. Like for us, less than one in 1,000 deploys would directly result in failure. Um, I could talk about this much more, but I only have a few minutes today. If you're interested and grab the slides later, um, the podcast link, I go more in depth on all this stuff. All right. Um, so Dr. Woods again, and also this is with John Alspa. This article is an ACMQ, good one to read as well. Um, resilience engineering enhances the adaptive capacity needed for responsive surprises, and that's their emphasis. A system with adaptive capacity is poised to adapt. It has some readiness to change how it currently works. It's models, plans, processes, behaviors. So this is more about how the humans work together than the humans adapting uh, the, the software part of the socio-technical system, and this is just as important. So we did this as well. Um, while we ha already had a lot of capacity to adapt the software part of the system, it still wasn't enough on its own. We had to find that extra adaptive capacity as we keep hearing about, how do we bring more to bear? Um, so we had to adapt how we were working together as humans. Um, another person that's done great research I'd recommend is Dr. Laura McGuire. Um, it was described this activity to me as dynamic reconfiguration. We talked about it in person. I haven't seen um, a great quote I, I, I could put in here that's, that's published. Um, but this is kind of like you're hit with a surprise and you move around um, to solve the problem at hand. So yeah, we reconfigure ourselves on the fly to collaborate and tackle um, the problem in the Super Bowl. And what we did was we put engineers in charge of the project for one. Um, we created the priorities. We set, said, hey, these are the problems we're gonna attack. Our PMs were still a huge help in working with stakeholders, but they focused more on turning like groups of engineers into acting on those problems. Um, and anyone working on these initiatives joined a daily standup so we could adjust as needed. So we were constantly making small tweaks as we went. Um, this was totally across all the pods. There was no, no pod boundaries or anything like that in this time. Just, hey, anybody working on this, let's get together and make sure we're, um, you know, doing what's best today. Um, as already noted, we threw out Q1 plans and I think we're running a little low on time. So I'm gonna just gloss over this. But this was an example of reciprocity on the last slide. You know, I, I guess I have to explain it. Um, we had an issue where people were still concerned about their metrics and we called this out like to, um, you know, leadership and engineering. And I think within a day, um, execs in a really thoughtful way, just kind of made it clear like, hey, don't worry about metrics right now. Um, our, our goal is this one thing, it's Project Daisy, it's having a successful Super Bowl. So um, to me, this was a small example of reciprocity. We need a lot of folks to give up their resources and targets now in the short term to accomplish this big goal of Project Daisy. So Woods again notes, effective organizations build reciprocity across roles and levels. Reciprocity is commitment to mutual assistance one unit donates from their limited resources now to help another in their role. So both achieve benefits for overarching goals and trust that when the roles are reversed, the other unit will come to its aid. Um, I think one of the things that sets us up for this at, at TFD is uh, one of our values of play team. Um, not gonna read the whole description, but the second part, which I think is the important part, second piece is that if we do need help, we don't hide it, we ask for it. Team member needs our help, we get in there and help them. All right, let's talk about some of the fixes really quick. So one of the first things we found was um, the AWS SDK in JavaScript has a default of 
fix 50 max sockets. We, we noticed this because we faced high latencies on DynamoDB. That was one of the first bottlenecks we hit. We used on demand mode, so, so that didn't make any sense to us. Um, and it turned out the transactions were queuing because they couldn't get a socket. Um, after looking into other libraries, we, like this one, we noticed that like a lot of them didn't implement Keep Alive, so there was also a lot of CPU overhead for like setting up and tearing down sockets. Another problem we faced was running, uh, just running out of IP addresses in our VPC because Kubernetes uses a lot of them. Anybody else face that problem before? Yeah. A lot of people, yep. Um, so that launched us into a multi-week project where we had to launch a new VPC and Kubernetes cluster. I think it's a good example of the parallel change pattern. We deployed a new cluster, migrated each app one at a time, and then left the old cluster around a bit if we needed to roll back, kind of like a blue-green or canary deployment. Also a great example of things that might not show up in staging. Even if your VPC is identical, it's likely there's a lot of other things running in prod or infra that's scaled higher, that's using extra IPs, that's not in staging. At least that was the case for us. All right, so the last one I'll note is Postgres' troubles with connections. Probably also another known thing, but we had never scaled this high, um, at least here. So we fixed it by deploying PG Bouncer to a Kubernetes cluster um, using the linked image. So that creates a persistent pool of connections to the database. So all the CPU overhead of creating connections from clients can be offloaded. And we were CPU constrained, so this helped a lot. So a lot of things we just didn't have time to fix, as I noted, so we just turned them off. Um, we have this eager loading architecture in our GraphQL layer uh, where it tries to load everything about a customer and not only their account details, but like their orders, their stock levels. Essentially, it just creates a significant amount of noise on every heavily trafficked uh, table in that Postgres DB. Um, so since we couldn't re-architect the whole GraphQL layer because there's so much depending on it, we just created like a block list of sort um, to bypass it where it wasn't actually needed. All right, this is kind of, kind of a longer one. I'm going to gloss over it because, again, I think we're running low on time. Um, the audit log is essentially this, like this custom implemented transaction log living in our application code. Um, doesn't really make much sense because Postgres already has um, a transaction log implementation called the wall log, and you can ingest it through a replication slot. Uh, so, yeah, we're doing extra writes. This is a coupling point to all the different tables that, you know, are, are auditing things. And then the biggest problem, um, which I need to touch on, is that it, the implementation itself uses sub-transactions or nested transactions, which can bring Postgres to a screeching halt. Um, and I'm showing code here for upsert in SQLize, which is the ORM we use, but the finder create function is implemented the same way, and that's what we were using that caused this problem. And one of the biggest challenges we faced was just getting buy-in to turn the audit log off. This would create gaps in reports, and, and we did do it, so it did create gaps in report that we weren't sure could be backfilled or not, and people were very worried about that. Um, so this is just some more on nested transactions if you grab the slides. Um, and then the last thing, um, we just turned off any service that wasn't critical to sign up. And landing is critical to sign up, but it didn't really need to hit the API, so we removed that. And we did this with knobs and levers, so we could turn it off right before the ad, turn it back on, hopefully not disrupt the business too much. Uh, some of this was shedding actual load. Some was just de-risking the possibility, you know, someone goes in CRM and asks for all of the users for some unknown reason and creates some terrible query on the database. And lastly, we still prepared for everything to go wrong, um, even though uh, we had that amazing load test at the end and we were pretty confident. Um, we had waiting rooms and fallbacks for basically anything we were turning off or anything that could crash um, where a customer might have a bad experience. Okay, so I don't think we have time to show the ad, but again, you want to go on YouTube or you can grab the slides. Oops, it's playing. <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then the last thing, just to touch, there's, there's a lasting impact of this. Um, the last one's maybe the only thing that's not clear, again, out of time, but um, look into that. I, a lot of times, resilience leads to creating more robustness, but robustness can also remove our ability uh, to adapt. So it makes the system more brittle, harder to adapt. Thank you, that's all. Thank you.